This podcast is brought to you by Gundog Outdoors and Dakota 283 Kennels. Hi, hunters. Thank you for tuning into the Flushman and Dustin podcast brought to you by Nick and Tyler, the boys from Ringnecks and Retrievers. In this podcast, we will talk about guns, dogs, gear, and our successes and failures in the field through our combined 40 years of experience. We speak with hunters just like you from across the nation about their days in the field and the many memories they built with their friends and family. We are excited to have you listen. Now let's get to Flushing and Dustin. Hunters, welcome back to another Flushing and Dustin podcast. We are excited to have you guys come back and listen. Uh, we got a special guest on tonight. He has wrote a couple articles uh, for Pheasants Forever. So we're definitely going to touch on that. Uh, excited to have him on. We read his articles and was like, man, we got to we got to bring him on the podcast. We got to talk about some things. Uh, so excited to have him here. His name is Douglas Spala, and I'm going to have him introduce his Instagram handle because I know I'm going to mess it up. Uh, but Douglas, give yourself an introduction and we'll keep going. Yeah, yeah. So like you said, my name is Douglas Spala. Um, my, inter- my Instagram is Shunka O'War. So that was the name of my last lap. I had her for about three and a half years. Uh, Shunka is... Lakota Sioux for dog. So her name is Dog of War. Nice. So that's me. That's the that's awesome. Name. Yeah. So what brought about you getting into upland hunting? Yeah. So growing up, my father was into it. My older brothers were into it. All the boys on my mom's side were into it. The grandfathers were into it. So it just, it kind of was a thing that I started when I was a kid. I remember Oh, probably about eight or 10. I would go out with my father and brothers and stuff and we would go hunt and we didn't have a dog at that time. Well, I didn't have one. My brothers did. So I was the dog boy, basically walking through the fields, pick up the longest stick or the longest, uh, I don't know, reed or something and pretend to shoot and walk around it. Yeah. And shot down a bird. I'd hopefully find it if not. But I remember right when I was 12, I got my first dog. Runs with Shadow. Shadow. And she was a pretty good, she was a great dog too. I had her for 12 years, but nice. from being a kid, that that's it. I've always hunted. That's always been a thing. And spent my time upland and waterfowl. Nice. Did you, so was your first dog a lab as well? Correct. Yes. Okay. I, always, I, have only, I only run black lab females. So, so what, of- what draws you to the lab? Obviously we love retrievers. Nick, who he's not on tonight, he might stop in a little bit later. Uh, he had a work meeting come up, but he loves black labs. Uh, his dog is a black lab diesel, awesome dog. So, what drew you to the labs? Uh, that was like the first dog I was introduced to. My older brothers had black labs. My dad always preached lab enthusiasm and everything we did. So, that first dog I got was a black lab. And at that moment, I knew forever. That would be the dog that I have on my truck. And there's so many other dogs in the world, so many other good bird dogs, but I know what I get with that black lab and I know what I can give others with that black lab. So that's just my lane that I fill. For sure. Did So when you, when you got your first lab, you said you were 12 years old. Mm -hmm. Okay. Did you, and you're living currently in the city in Kansas city, uh, correct? Right in the, right in the heart of it. Um, the, uh, not the downtown but it's definitely city city style yeah yeah so when you were growing up did you live in the city as well then yeah i grew up in fremont nebraska do you know where that's at about uh, west of omaha okay i know where omaha is uh yeah. n- so it's never been about forty five thousand people so it's 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 a bedroom community for omaha so okay. it, it would be not quite the, a city i don't know i guess omaha yeah. is probably a city Besides Lincoln and Nebraska, but yeah, for it sure, definitely a little had that vibe, but not nearly anything like we moved out to Chicago. But yeah, yeah. So when you, you know, you obviously you're in the city, and it can be difficult probably to find training areas. Um, what what have you done to train your dog in the city, um, and how have you done that to be successful with your training? Yeah, and that, that can be an hour, two hour, three hour long conversation. Hey, we got all night, man. <laughs> but the big thing, first off, is just figuring out a plan that you have. You need to know what your plan is to train your dog. Starting from the first dog to the second dog to this dog, it's been Richard Walter's game dog. That's, that's my plan. And then as I've grown and developed and learned more about dog training, 
witness more good dogs. I implement different schemes from different other programs. But the first thing is start small, then you move on, but have that plan. And then you got to start dealing with the variables that the city presents. hundred percent. What, <laughs> a, what struggles have you, have you come across that you've had to overcome? Uh, let's give you, I'll give you an anecdote on this one. So right. the second dog, Shunka, I trained her in Chicago and just training a bird dog in the middle of the Gold Coast where I lived in Chicago. I don't know if you're familiar with the Gold Coast at all, but it's right north of the river. So you're right there. Okay. But I would do, I, I trained her all the way up to nine months. So we did all of our retrieving work, our flushing work, our everything. And I took her to our first hunt test. I think, um, is it is it Nick, right? He does yep. the, he does yep. the, yeah, he's, he's ran a couple hunt tests himself. Yeah. So I did that. I went out and did that first test and I got there. We walked up. She was at Perfect Hill. We lined up for our first mark. The bird goes. I'm like, oh yeah, this is going to be easy. We've been doing this all these months in the city. So <laughs> I send her. She takes a perfect line right to that bird. Gets there, stops, sits, and looks at me. And I'm oh. Like, uh oh. Uh, what do I do now? Mm, this is not good. So I said, my trill whistle. I tell her to pick it up, pick it up, pick it up. She doesn't. So I go, oh, all right, bring her back. And they're like, well, she's like the eighth dog to go. Maybe it was a bad one. I said, oh, okay. So we do the second mark. Same thing. Lined her up. She takes a perfect line, gets to that bird, sits and looks at me. I'm like, same thing. Triller, pick it up, pick it up, pick it up, come back. Nothing. Ooh, all right. Well, so I call her in. We walk away. I tell the judges, thanks for our time and everything. And I go to the car, <laughs> call my uncle, who's a, who's a pro. And you know, I'm a little teared up that I've been working so hard to train this great dog. And she won't pick up birds. And he goes, Douglas, I said, yeah, yeah, she just won't do it. And he, he says to me, did you ever train with birds? I said, no, no, I, train with birds. I live in the middle of Chicago. How can I train with birds? There's people everywhere. There's no way. He goes, well, there's your first mistake. Yeah. The birds. Oh, all right. So I think we were up in Wisconsin for that test. It was about three and a half hours from Chicago from our apartment. So it was, it was a long drive home and I was doing a lot of reflecting on that. But that first big challenge was when you live in a city, it's hard to use birds. You just, <laughs> if I were to throw out pigeons or if I were to wing pigeons or put them on anything or get some pheasants, people are going to be happy to see that. Yeah. Just just the environment that the city is in, all yep. the city units as well. So that would be the first big obstacle that I had to overcome is, ooh, one, you need to use birds. Everyone yep. has to use birds. Two, you just probably can't do that in the city as much. There's doves floating around, but. Yeah. So what do you, what do you do to get your dog on birds then for yeah. future work? So I just called up a local pro and that pro was about an hour and a half from Chicago and I'd go out there on the weekends and we'd work with live birds, put feathers in her mouth, work nice. with live birds. And then I'd take a few home with me and we'd throw them down our hallway. Yeah, 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 for them. sure. We'd do that and stuff too, <laughs> and just to get her used to it. And yep. that was when she was nine months and that was about September. So November we went home for our first big trip and she was pulling ducks out of the, out of the Platte River, so. And oh, nice. And up by the northeast part of the state. So we got over it fast. It just yeah. was a whoo, big learning curve for me because that was only dog two. So I wasn't quite ready for that. One. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I have. It's a different story. I wasn't at a hunt test, but there's a, a retriever training crew about, oh, probably 30 to 45 minutes south of me. And <clears throat> my dogs, you know, they were trained all, just upland specifically never been around a duck or anything mm -hmm. and they would pick up a pheasant no problem and we went to this training day and my younger one she picked it up totally fine brought it back and I was like all right I'm like my older one I'm hoping he's gonna go pick it up he goes out there turns around looks at me when he gets to it and then he rolls on it and I'm <laughs> like oh my gosh and I'm sitting there you know it's my first time ever around all these guys and I'm like, you know, I've never been to a training group like that, you know, completely greenhorn. I'm just like, wow, I'm making, I'm so embarrassed right now. You know, and I'm like, the guys are out there like trying to get him riled up to, you know, grab onto it. And he finally grabbed onto it, but he obviously didn't bring it all the way back. But uh, I could tell the, 
it was frustrating, you know, and it is important to train with, you know, if you're doing upland to obviously train with either a pheasant or a pigeon or something that has similar scent and feathers mm -hmm. that they're going to come across and ducks, you know, they, they smell different, you know, the, I, I just got some ducks, uh, for training this summer mm -hmm. from that crew and man, they smell like a pig farm. I open <laughs> up my freezer and I'm like, Oh, what is that stench? And I'm like, no wonder the dogs don't want to pick it up. It freaking smells like pig crap. <laughs> like i wouldn't pick it up either yeah you know and uh, that, that was one lesson to learn if you don't want to pick it up the dog sure isn't going to want to that first time they'll yeah. get it that first time they're just looking at you and looking at yep you know. and, and you know there's so many other dogs sent around and there's so much going on that when you go to a hunt test you know I, I talked to a couple guys and um he's like yeah i took my dog and he went out and peed on the duck he didn't even pick it up you know and he's like i've never had problems when we're at home doing it but he goes you know we're here with what bunch of different scent you yeah. know he's marking his territory but it's it's always funny when you you can talk about some of those stories that the training you know struggles that you go through that everybody else has probably experienced yeah you know, like, it makes it easy to tell other people because we all make mistakes oh and yeah she's a good dog and she uh, she, I lost her at three and a half, but man, she uh, had man. her plus retrieves on her in the field. I mean, she turned out to be a great, great dog and nothing limited us. I mean, that was just an obstacle that we yep. had to overcome it just back to the drawing board. So, and like you said, it's a, a learning curve on your part, you know, to make sure that that's covered and, um, yeah, it's, it's awesome. So now you're on to your third dog. Is that correct? Yeah. So how, how old is, uh, how's old your new dog? So this one is named Nakuto, which in Comanche is my fire. So we call her Kuto. So Ku okay. like a bird and then Tope like the color, Kuto. Nice. So, so how I guess old is she? She is 17 and a half weeks, going on 18 weeks this, this Saturday. So this is, this is the subject of the new Pheasants Forever series. Yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. And speaking of Pheasants Forever, how did you, how did you submit or what did you do to write an article i i read it and i thought it was great it had me in, intrigued the whole time and like i said that's why i wanted to bring you on because i wanted to talk to you in person i thought it was an awesome story and i thought it was things that a lot of people can relate to because not everybody has perfect training setups right we don't all have the perfect ground to run on and um so tell us about that yeah, yeah. So actually, I got the connection through another one of your former guests, Eric Peterson. He oh, wrote a nice. article in, in Pheasants Forever in the fall about to make a hunter about him and his sons. And it just really resonated with me. So I wrote him a comment and told him all about it and how it really meant a lot to me to see those images. I mean, he takes some powerful, powerful images. He is an amazing photographer. Very and that shows with the words that he has, I was just blown away. And I just gave him a heartfelt message on how much of it, even now you can just tell. It was it was a powerful article to me and I loved it. And he forwarded my information on the Pheasants Forever. And they reached out and kind of talked a little bit. And we decided this is, let, let's do a series like this. And I'll tell you, it was, they reached out the end of January and my last dog passed away December 16th. So I was kind of in a rut there for a while. And they reached out and asked me about the dog and asked me how I was doing. And I, I, I remember I got like a Instagram message from one of them and I was like, is this real? <laughs> but we talked about it and I told them that I had lost my dog and I was kind of, and when I lost that last dog, I put all my stuff away. I, stopped hunting from December on, missed the big migration, missed a lot of late season pheasant hunting. And I kind of was in a hole and they were reaching out to me, asked me to write something, kind of sparked a little flame inside of me. For sure. And I said, all right, yeah, let's do this. And you know what, I'm gonna get a new dog and let's, let's do this again. Let's do this city dog thing. And so that's where her name comes from is she is my fire. And that's fire yeah. marked by the PF folks. And that's why I'm trying to make this thing the best I can. So I got a great photographer of this series. We're really working on this writing. So it's it's been fun and it's great to hear that you guys like it. I hope and it'll be a series, so we'll do a couple more. And I hope people get little bits of information from it. Oh, for sure. And we will get her in, in, 
in the field hopefully this winter that's that's our plan so it's, yeah it's cool it's, it's an emotional thing for me because it came from a dark place but they really helped me bring me out of that spot and here we go and it's been fun it's been great and this dog is she's another good dog and we'll, we'll see we'll see how she turns out but i'm i'm excited yeah for sure man and so how long will your series with pheasants forever be so you have two i believe two articles out now correct Yep, and we took the pictures for the third series, so that's in editing right now. Okay. I think we'll have two over the summer, maybe one in the fall, maybe two. We kind of projected six just to kind of see how it goes and get us to that first time where I put that dog on the ground. We'll yeah. see how the progression goes, because I don't want to over over promise for the audience, but I do want to tell a good story. And oh, 100%. This is a good opportunity to see from beginning to first four feet on the ground. Yeah. I agree, man. And like I said, your first two articles were very engaging and I enjoyed reading them. So I'm, I'm looking forward to see your progress with the new pup. What, what training phase are you currently in with that pup? We're in the, she's in four months. So she's at the phase where when I say sit, you better sit. And yeah. Come get here. Nice. It's still fun. And we're doing our little puppy retrieves. I posted a little Instagram video of us. She's got some new yep. docking trainers, which are really helpful for they uh, are. bird ho- bird holding methods in. So we're, we're, we're still, the first one was kind of the fun phase. Now we're in the fun but serious phase. And then once those baby teeth come out, we'll switch into the, all right, it's time to be a big girl now. Let's yeah, go. 100%. Um, so is your, are you planning on doing most of your training uh, within the city or are you do you have a trainer that you're going to go to to for land and whatnot to train with so most of our stuff is in the city and i'm sure most folks would tell you that a lot of the stuff you can do within 60 yards oh, heel thumb, retrieves place training working back and forth i mean how long is your is your uh is your uh your lead caller, I guess. Yeah. That, but we've already done one inter- session of bird introduction. We go to a trainer up north in Gower. His name's Lyle Steinman, and he's he's a fabulous, fabulous dog trainer, and he's got some great ground. So we went up there one time, and then I volunteered for him too to watch his big dogs run. Nice. And that's been a great learning opportunity because yeah, I did the bird dog in the city once, but let's see what we can do to improve this thing. Let's make this oh, better. Yeah. We got the pictures and the writing, let's, let's really give something for the audience. And that's, that's kind of what I'm doing with working with a big time pro like him to just get those experiences, learn his techniques. Yep. We can really give everyone else a good experience. Yeah. Yeah. How do you, so, you know, some people might be nervous to reach out to a pro that has a bunch of experience, right. Or someone that, you know, that's what they do for a living. And you're coming in, not you necessarily, because you're not really a greenhorn. You've had a couple of dogs underneath you that you've worked with, you know, but how do you go about reaching out to a trainer and what's kind of the expectation, you know, if uh, someone's coming in saying, Hey, I want to work with you. What, how'd you go about that conversation? Yeah. I think the big thing is figuring out what kind of dog you have, what kind of dog and what kind of dog you want, and what's your hunting schedule? Are you a person that's going to hunt four times in a week, or four times in a month, four times in a year? Or are you yeah. that guy that's going to go out and try to get a hundred hunts in in a year? That's my goal every year. Yeah, how hundred percent. And then figure out what the program, what the pro offers, what kind of. Because Lyle is, I mean, I don't know many pros that are better than him. Many pros that have more accolades than that guy. Yep. I'm, I, I raise, uh, I need a hunting dog. So having that high powered, strictly obedient field trial dog, while I can train in those programs, there's things that I need that he doesn't always focus on. So being able to be like, all right, get, all right, guy, here's what I'm doing. Here's where I'm at. I'm probably inexperienced, but here's what I want to get to. And those pros have seen so many dogs that they more likely than not, they can help you out and figure out where you are at, where you want to go, and where you're going to finish. And first, just do a phone call. And again, time is money. So if you go yeah. out there and pay for a session, they're going to help you. Oh, 100%. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah, they want you to come back. I mean, 
obviously. And so when you, when you were looking at your, when your new pup, did you go through, did you already have a kennel kind of in mind or how did you go about finding the dog that you felt would best fit your needs? It was working with Lyle on the last one. I said, uh, he told me, hey, when you're ready, when you're ready for a new dog, let me know. Yeah. And after I got, I got the call with the PF folks, uh, he, I called him. I said, all right, let's do this. I'm ready. I'm ready. He goes, all right, go. There's a guy out in Maine. It's Maine? What's, oh, what's cool. going on out in Maine? Bill Pond Retrievers, he got some really good dogs. So I called him. His name's David Eaton. He's got that Maine accent, but he's, He's great, and he's got some great bloodlines out there. So I told him, here's where I'm at. Here's what I want to do. This is the kind of dog I need. And he got me the litter I wanted. She dropped February 6th. And nice. We flew her in April 9th, I believe, all the way from Maine. So she was a jet setter. She went from Maine to Boston, Boston <laughs> to Dallas, Dallas to Omaha. And then I went up to Omaha and picked her up. And Dang. I got her in, I don't know, the retriever world, what do you have? I have Goldens. Nick Gold. has Nick has labs. Okay. Yeah, the retrieval world is full of the, you know, the American, the British, UK yeah. ones, and then the bloodlines go deep. Yeah. So I, I was looking for some of the, I think they call it old blood. Like the sire of this dog has been deceased for 10, 15 years, I believe. So it's all oh, really? Like, yeah. Artificial breeding. So oh, nice. And it's cool to work with a pro that you know really well. And I, I say, obviously, the first conversation is tough to have. I remember the first time I called Lyle, I heard him on, I think I heard him on a podcast or something. I was like, oh, man, that guy knows some good stuff. So I got out, I looked him up, looked at all of his stuff, called him up and said, hey, this is where I'm at. This is what I need to do. And can you help me? He said, yeah, yeah, I can help you. And I, I was like, whoa, whoa, he's yeah. a pretty impressive person in the dog. I'm surprised that he was just going to be like that. But no. <laughs> But getting to know that person that helps you along helps you figure out what kind of dog you want. And he's had dogs that have the same bloodline. And okay. You know, people who have been around those lines know those dogs' nuances, those intricacies, and what to look for and how to fit them to the program. Yeah. And I'm sure where you get your golden, where do you get your goldens from? Uh, so mine personally, so these were my first hunting dogs. So I wasn't, my kennel wasn't um they were just from iowa it's kind of a, a family friend but yeah. they did have hunting lines behind them uh so they didn't come from a reputable breeder by any means but i do have um the kennels that i will go through in the future um, i'm going to look at thunderstruck retrievers hmm. uh, they're up in minnesota where does uh, carson wentz get his retrievers from do you know where does nick carson wentz uh that's where he got that's what I thought. That yeah, that's really where he got bad. it from. And that's how I actually, so I didn't know about him. And I follow him on, we follow him on Instagram, Wentz yeah. Bros Outdoors. Yeah. And uh, he got a, I think it was it last year that he got a new retreat. I think it was last yeah. year he got a new golden. And uh, he mentioned him and I was like, oh man, I got to do some, I got to do some research <laughs> quick, you know. And, um, and I was reading just, you know, the titles that they have on them, the, the people. And, uh, just after hearing, you know, his, he, he did a whole like story on why he chose them. And I'm like, Oh man, these guys are super good. And, um, so that's what I plan on doing next. It won't be for a, a few years yet. You know, my dogs are still, my oldest is four and my youngest is three, mm, uh, you know, yeah. so they still got some good hunting years left. Uh, I'll probably wait till they're about in their eight years season uh, and then be getting one to you know fully train for a year so by the time they hit their ninth season y'all have another young pup to there you go you know work the afternoons after they've worked the mornings <laughs> yeah so, there's a couple of good breeders out of nebraska that i've heard of that do those retrievers but or your goldens but yeah. I, i've been seeing more lyle's got a good golden up there that is impressive really uh, don't sleep on the goldens there, there's some there's some good ones yeah i think you know it you have to find the right lines right um you know they a lot of there's kind of a bad rep about the goldens being the pretty the pretty boys you know because a lot mm -hmm. of people breed them for just you know house dogs or the show line or you know maybe just the um 
you know, the therapy dog and not really the field bred, but there's definitely some good, you, but you have to do your research, you know, mm-hmm. uh, uh, old red kennels in Texas. They've uh, they, I think they got a good thing going South fork retrievers are over in Illinois. Yeah. Um, I think they got a good line going, but you know, yeah, like I said, sometimes if you don't have all the money to spend, you can still get a good a good bird dog out of something that's yeah. I think what do they say, a farm breeding or whatever. Yeah, something. yeah, you, you know, still- and, yeah, and they might not be as trainable, or they might have not. It might not come out naturally to them, right? But you put enough you work in with there. the dog. I believe you can still get there to where you need it to be. Cause we're not, we're not, tri- I, I don't trial. So I don't, I don't yeah, me neither. Precision. I just, but you can get a good hunting dog that way. Yep. Not, not to say that the, that you can't, it just, you gotta spend a bunch of money on them, but you can still yeah. get one. Yeah. There was the one guy we had on our podcast. Uh, it was a pretty good amount of episodes back. He's Riley, Rye Glenn gun dogs. He mm-hmm. runs a little Cocker Spaniels and he, I'll probably mess up this quote. But he met, uh, it was a gun dog trainer uh, in the Hall of, Hall of Fame. I can't think of what the guy's Whoa. name is off the top of my head. But uh, he met him out there and he's like, you know, he was all happy. He's like, give me like some of your best input. You know, what's the best thing you can do for a dog? And he said, um, he goes, the best advice that I can give you is um, your dog's basically got to be train it to what you want it to be, right? He goes, a good dog is a dog that does exactly what you want it to do. So if your expectation is your dog is going to go out to a pheasant field, he's going to flush a rooster, you're going to shoot it, and he's going to bring it back to you, and he's going to drop it at your feet, and you don't want the delivery to hand. Mm-hmm. If that's If you're happy with that, that dog is perfect for you, yeah. you know? And I've, that really resonated with me because at the time, like I said, these were my first two dogs and I didn't have a full training program, you know, and um, now we're in a, a full program and things have changed. You know, my mind shifted with the, my expectations for my dogs. But at that point I was like, man, that's how I am. I want my dogs to find the bird. And I want them <laughs> to bring it back to me every single time. You know, um, I didn't care how pretty it was. Um, cause I don't, I don't do trials either. Uh, I, I thought about it. Um, but I just, I've never got into it. I think it's, I do think it's good though in the summer cause you're still getting, you know, feathers in their mouth, but I have, um, ducks and bird wings myself. So it's kind of, you know, I just, it's, yeah. it's expensive well, when you get two dogs. Know, I train with, I trained the last dog with trialers. Yeah, but I, a lot. I know this is upland, but I hunt a lot of ducks on the Platte River. Yeah, they want perfect lines in and out for the most part. And on the river, if you have a duck or even you have an eight, ten pound goose upstream on a river, that's inefficient and hard work. So yeah, you need to be able to find land as soon as you get that bird as fast as possible. Yeah, but the precision, the obedience, the setups that pros can give you—it's it's fun. Oh yeah. It's fun. And I think, I think one of the coolest things, so I was never an up or a, never a waterfowl hunter before this previous season, my cousin, uh, he's younger than me, introduced oh. me to it. And I was like, Oh man, like, you like it? this is awesome. Like I had, I had a ton of fun doing it. Um, and you know, I felt bad because I didn't, ha- I didn't, I didn't know how to call. I didn't have decoys, you know, he had everything. And he basically was like, just do this set these here. I'll do everything else. You just shoot. I'm like, all right, sounds good to me, you know? And, uh, you know, it's just so awesome. It, it's just so much different than upland hunting. I love upland hunting. We'll always love upland hunting. The rush of a rooster busting out of the grass, you know, it's just a few things that are greater than that. I tell you what, though. Yeah, it's, it's just amazing. But the cool part about, I, the one thing that I love about waterfowl hunting is the mornings watching like the sun come up mm. and just like the sights that you, you know just the sunrises that you get to see i mean it's it's just so awesome and then when you can hear like the geese from you know 500 <laughs> yards out and you can see them over there and so you know you start calling and they kind of like 
they start circling back towards you and then they cup up and I'm like, oh man, that is, it's so cool when it works out like that. There's more times than not that they came in and flared, but hey, yeah. it is what it is, you know? No, hey, I don't know if I said this earlier, but my growing up, it'd be flat river ducks in the morning, mid, oh, I think I said this, mid afternoon, mid morning pheasants, and then finish up with goose in a field. So we man, did it all. We man, you got all. some good, you got some good hunting in when you were young. Yeah, yeah, we, I was fortunate to have a lot of good opportunities. And that's kind of part of this series is to show you my experience. Cause I, I, I had good family friends, good friends. I mean, there's pictures of my grandfather and my uncles going out and golfing and bringing their shotguns and they have golf bags there. Filled that with is food. awesome. I mean, it, it's just in our family and it's a thing. And my father's birthday is on the November 26th. Oh, so nice. every couple of years that you get it on, you get it on Easter. Or on Thanksgiving. Yeah. <laughs> so that's, those are always big times because we do family hunts where we do ducks and pheasants and maybe get a couple turkeys on the on the plate on the on the table yeah. for him for his birthday. So that was that was his birthday cake usually. But yeah, I just Nebraska's great. I don't think people talk about it too much, maybe because they're trying to keep it under under. Yeah. Rap. My so one of the guys that um I went goose hunting. It was probably, so it was before I got my dogs and I did it and I was like, so maybe it, I got into waterfall because I have dogs now. Right. Mm -hmm. I think it's just, the one thing that I love is for waterfall is the obedience and I'm getting off on a little tangent, but <laughs> the obedience that the waterfowl dogs have compared to other dogs is just top notch. I mean, there, there's so much obedience that goes into it to have a successful dog down the road that, and I just love that. I love, so I have uh, some friends that are canine officers mm. and, you know, to see how those dogs perform, how obedient they are, you know, my expectation for my dogs is I want them to be that obedient. When I say something, I want them to do it. And, you know, I want, that's how I want it to be. And finding the uh waterfowl trainer i felt like that was you know a turning point for me and my dogs just for the obedience level but i like i said i had a a friend that he, i goose hunted with him a couple years um a couple years ago and he's from nebraska and he goes back out there that's where his family's from and he goes where back out there i knew you're gonna ask that and i cannot think of the town it's close to lincoln yeah. Uh, but I cannot think of what the small town is that he's yeah. from. Um, but yeah, he talks about just the gobs of geese that come through there. And I'm like, you know, he has a, he got an 18 foot trailer full of, God, I can't remember how many dozens of full body decoys he, he has, you know, and I'm just like, oh man, you know, and when I first hunted with him, I was like, ah, I'm not really into it, you know, and but then my cousin introduced me and I had my dogs and I could see, you know, how much fun it would be for them. And so. And it's a good mix because you just, I, I don't know how Iowa is exactly, but in Nebraska and some other states, you start with dove September 1. Yep. You go into early teal and they're usually a little break unless you hit your state travel. Sometimes you go yep. to the, hit that yep. early goose season, come back down, you got your big duck season, goose season. Then November, you start with your pheasants. So you have that good, you keep that dog on point from September all yep. the September till pheasant starts. And then the season really hits. Yeah. Pheasants, then you got your goose seasons continuing. And then if you travel around, you can hit your ducks in that second split. Oh, yeah. Summer. Well, now even South Dakota is open till the end of January, which is so, nice. So if you want to work winter like, as we used to, so. Yeah, you can get up there still in January and hit those lights, but still, be careful up in South Dakota. Oh, you never well. know. Well, it can this, get bad fast up there. Yeah, this year it, it was the sea, uh, second, the second week they had a horrible snowstorm. Yeah, was, when did you go up to South Dakota this past year? So we go up the uh, we leave the Saturday after Thanksgiving. So okay whatever date that is. And then we go the first week of December. Um, we figure it's probably cold enough 
at that time, you know, it's not super warm. Um, it's not super late in the season to where they've had a ton of pressure. Um, but we like that time. It gives us an extended holiday, you know, yeah. having the Thanksgiving yeah. days off and the extra week. Um, so that's when, that's when we go, we got it booked this year already. Where are you going? Uh, we go, so we're staying in a small town by Pierre, South Dakota. Yeah. Um, it's just, we found an Airbnb, which we always like those. It, I already you know, talked about it last year. It's the same one to use. Or? No, we used a different one because uh, we're going further west because we want to try to get into some sharp tail. All so right. we've we've never hunted for upland. We've, you know, quail, uh, Hungarian partridge and uh, pheasant is what we've been on. And we've never done a sharp tail hunt uh, hmm. or any grouse. So we want to head a little further west uh, and get into try to get into those, uh, especially cause you can hunt those starting at eight o'clock in the morning. Yeah. Up there. If we can get on those, you know, start early and then get into some pheasant. So it should be, should be pretty fun. We'll see how it goes. You never know. Well, we up for winter. I used to go with my family a bunch in those, uh, in those reservations actually when I was younger. Oh, that nice. Sioux name comes from Prashunka, but yep. last year we went with some friends up near winter. So like Tipton County area. Okay. Is, just north of Nebraska. And if you go down further in Nebraska, right there, kind of by Niagara and stuff, there's a really good prairie chicken. Oh, really? River. Nice. Uh, Rock County, go all the way east to Spencer. That's it's some good prairie chicken country. But I'll have to check that out. Yeah, last year I went with these guys, um, good family friends. We went up there and they own a gun shop or something. So they had some guys out from the East Coast, I think maybe Massachusetts or something. Okay. So we were peasants during the day and then. They're crazy with their high power rifles, so they do that night vision coyote hunting at night, which was nice. unbelievable. I, I didn't really do that as much because I was resting the dog, but yeah. it, it, that's pretty cool too up there. That would be pretty cool. I've I've seen some videos, but I've never never been a part of it. I bet that'd be interesting. I, to see. I, I, stuff. I was yeah, I'll look at it, but I'm not going to shoot this because I don't want to break it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no kidding. They get. I bet they're not cheap. I've never looked at the price, but. Ooh. Yeah, they're not cheap. They're, they're def- I didn't want to touch them. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So what's your what's your plans for the summer? Where, let's say September 1st is opening day of season, right? What is your expectations for your current pup? Get her in the water, start working on doubles, singles, marks, working on her casting, and really getting that nose right. So uh, this fall might be a little slow for me because I want to get that dog ready. I don't know if we'll put her on the ground this year. I'm hoping to, but it'll just kind of depend on how she does. But really just tuning up that obedience, do, doing the retrieves. And I like the the retrieves aren't so much for pheasant hunting, but yep. more just getting her the work and the repetition. But I will tell you, We've done some good pheasant hunts where I don't mind being a blocker with the dog because she can mark the last yeah. dog can mark. So I'd sit up there and when those pheasants go up the side or the front and tip to over shoot them, right? Shoot them. She'd mark them and pick them up and bring them to me. And that Heck yeah. came out for it then. And some people don't like to mark, so like to work their dogs. And if we hunt with a lot of pointers or anything, they're they're wanting to work their dogs. And I say, that's fine. They can point and we'll mark. So yeah. <laughs> I, I like I said, I love watching a dog retrieve. You know, it is fun watching them work a bird, but man, when they come back and they're so proud of having that bird in their mouth. Oh, they, oh, they, when, I, when, when Shunka used to bring them, even if we went to a preserve up in Wisconsin, I remember and we were planting birds. I remember I would be so happy when she would bring me a bird because we travel two or three hours to get to a cool preserve, we plan and pay for our birds and just seeing her with that big rooster in her mouth, that, that was that's what made all of that preparation worthwhile. I mean, it was Chicago wasn't easy to get in and out of. So no, I bet not. Up there and seeing birds in her mouth was, was made me happy because I knew once we made it back home to the Great Plains, she'd really be after it and make people happy. So yeah, yeah, man, I can imagine. You know, and it's just when you do so much work with your dog and you from puppy to you know, especially your, your new one, you know, you, the moment you put him, put her on the ground and she gets that first retrieve, man, 
I can't imagine how special that's going to be for you. <laughs> you know, like you were telling your story earlier and I got a little chills just thinking like, you know, when you're saying lighting a fire under you and just getting you back going and man, yeah. that's going to be you know, awesome. I, up again. I, I was down and everyone gets down and it's hard when you lose those special dogs. Yeah, dude. That's another facet of this story is it's tough to lose those good dogs, but they leave you with gifts and treats and happy memories and you move forward and you learn from it. And I'll tell you what, Shunka gave me three and a half good years and I made a lot of friends and a lot of good memories. And I, I can tell you five people right now that have dogs because they saw what Shunka and I had together. And it was That's tough. awesome. And I wish I could share more of that her with, all this audience now because she was a special dog and but uh yeah man she left a good impression on me i mean i have friends in chicago from her I, we'd go out to the dog park and people would just be like wow that's it's a really well-trained dog and eventually people would be like is that a hunting dog yeah yeah, it's yeah. A dog. and they'd say i don't even know what that is but it's so cool yeah <laughs> that's awesome i have a, a hunting dog and they're well trained <laughs> i have a so about a hundred and something yards up the road, I have a city park that has a nice pond in it that I do a lot of my water work at. Nice. Nice. And uh, they have baseball parks up there. So a lot of times right now they have baseball going on, you know, and I'll get out there and I'll start doing water work. And next thing I know, you know, five minutes into it, I have like 10 people, you know, all turned around, not watching the baseball games, all looking at me. And I'm like, <laughs> okay dogs do not screw up right now make sure you do good you know and we were walking walking home one night and i had them on heel and they're both carrying so i always make them carry their the bumper all the way back home me too me too this is like you know just some reinforcement and whatnot and uh we walked by this couple and the i'm guessing the wife is the the woman she goes man, those are such well-trained dogs. And the guy goes, I guarantee they're hunting dogs. And I was like, yeah, you know, and it's just, it's so awesome. I have, you know, little kids watching and, you know, and that's kind of the one thing that we love about doing this podcast. We had a, um, a person reach out to us today from Ohio, him and his son just started listening to our podcast and the son's 14 years old. And he's, you know, they're asking us questions and, they're like, you guys have labs. He got a, you know, just got a lab and wants to learn more about it. And I'm like, I mean, being a kid. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and it's like, we started this, you know, because COVID was going on and we were like, you know, we need to do something. And now it's like, you get people to reach out to you and you, they ask questions about that, you know, and it's like, man, this is, this is cool. You know, it, it, you're introducing stuff. You're teaching the young generation, you know, about dogs, about hunting how much fun it can be and it's mm -hmm. just you know and you, like you had it growing up you had so much fun doing it and now look where you're at you know you're yeah, writing me. articles for pheasants <laughs> forever you gotta, you know. i will say that's been special to see two of my dogs on pheasants forever man that is I, awesome you know, my you're like your guy that my 14 year old self that i had two dogs on pheasants forever i would have fainted there's no way yeah. I that. now i do yeah oh, I, I don't look at it it's special yeah but you're talking about people watching you train. So I lived in a high rise luxury apartment complex, 300 some units in it. I lived on the 23rd floor and across the street from us was a big open green space. Not sure why it was there, but it was. So every morning we'd go out and train. We'd do our marks, we'd, we'd do our retrieves, we'd do everything. And one day this guy came down and he's like, hey, what are you always doing out there with your dog? I said, oh, we're training to hunt and stuff. We're training, we're just doing our dog training. He's like, yeah, I think I'm going to get a dog too. And he was a deer hunter. He got a deer in Michigan. In, yeah. uh, Michigan. And he told me he's going to get a Vishla. I was like, oh, I love Vishlas. I, I love, they're just, they run forever and they're good. Yeah, they do. And he happened to live above me in our building. And we became really good friends. One night he invited me up to do a bourbon tasting in his house I was like, nice. yeah, i'll come hang out and i go up there and this guy has every bourbon you could ask for so Dang. he spoiled me with bourbon so i don't even drink it anywhere anymore <laughs> he's got the good stuff. yeah too good of stuff for you but he ended up getting a vishla so he trained it 
he set it off for a little bit. And then when it was ready, we went to a preserve in Illinois. And he had the beeper collar on his fistula, and Shimko was with me being a flusher. And growing up, we did this too. And the brace to me is a pointer and a flusher. And his dog pointed beautifully and it had that beeper collar on. And I remember the first time we went out there, we set out a bunch of birds because we were, you know, we're city folks. So we just wanted to go out and put a bunch yeah. of birds on and have after it. And the first couple of points that that dog points and it does that beeper collar, beep, 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 beep. beep. And after two or three birds, Shunka would realize that that beep going crazy with me meant his dog Wally was on a point and she would put her ears up and just charge in there. Oh, that's awesome. Birds. And it was so pretty. And after that, we called it the thunder and lightning hunt because yeah. Shunka was, she was 63 pounds, but she was bigger than that fish. That oh, yeah. Just, so every year we do a thunder and lightning hunt now. Nice. Um, so we did that for two years and then Shunka passed away on the 16th and I had planned a trip to go to Chicago to do our Thunder and Lightning hunt. And we did it again this, this, this past December. Uh, she wasn't there, but another friend of ours who had a chocolate lab was there and that was his first ever hunt. So this oh. is a tradition we'll keep doing every year, our Thunder yeah. and Lightning hunt. I hope this dog's ready because come December, we're, we're, he, that, that dog Wally's gonna see a new Labrador, but. Oh, for sure. It was crazy. I mean, that's that's how that friendship started. And he's a lifelong friend now. Yep. Talk once a week. He's he's got a new kid that I send gifts. We're we're real close. But it's yeah. it's amazing to me to see how much these dogs impact our life and the friends and people they bring into our lives because of them. I would have never met him if it wasn't for my dog. And yep. He's a lifelong friend. I have a couple other ones in Chicago that yeah. are like because all because of the dogs. It's yep. It's crazy. Yeah. I, that's what I love about this community. That's why I love about doing the podcast is I, you know, we get to meet guys like you we get to meet hunters from all over and share stories. And now we stay in touch, you know, and our hope is that we get to hunt with a lot of our guests that come on the yeah. podcast. So hopefully you're close enough. We can hit oh, yeah. up a preserve somewhat sometime, you know, and, or even yeah. get on some public ground, some private ground, you know, get a good hunt in. and good. I'll tell you, so when I lived in Chicago, we always drive back and take a week off for Thanksgiving and Christmas. And we would work our way north through Wisconsin to Minnesota and down through Iowa. What's that interstate that runs north of Des Moines? Uh, there, well, there's Interstate 80, then there's 35. 35. There's some good public ground out oh, there. Oh, yeah. The Minnesota border that. Oh, the dog and I'd hop out, hit that. There's there's a couple yeah. like right off that highway, I think, too. Yeah. If you get northwest Iowa, whoo, whoo, you are in you're getting in some good bird country. Yeah. Man. Yeah. I've been I've shot a couple of Iowa birds in my day. Oh, and we'd 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 make that trip real slow, take a couple of days, stop yeah. at a lodge in Wisconsin, stop at a lodge in Minnesota, and then come down through Iowa, hit some public stuff. And I, nice. I think that was pretty. And it's weird. You're where are you at in Iowa? So I live just south of Cedar Rapids. Nick okay. lives actually in the over by Des Moines. Um, he lives that northeast part of Iowa is really hilly. That Decora area. So yeah, it's cool you have the hills and yep. what's that scenic view over there? Yeah, uh, Geneva or what is that? Uh, Guttenberg has like a really nice lookout area yeah. of northeast. Yeah. yeah, that's a beautiful country. That's actually where Nick uh, grew up at. Okay. Is in that area. And we, so surprisingly, we went and did some bird hunts up there this year. Mm -hmm. And that's more known for big old white tails. You know, yeah. it's a really good area. But man, we got into some good bird population. Mm -hmm. A lot of farmers are starting to, um, it's slowly, but I feel like there's a lot more that are starting to put in that 30, 40 acres of switchgrass, you know, and that's all it takes to start getting the that population back you know and the nice thing is is it's more condensed so you get you know more birds in there right um but so we had really good luck that way um northwest so man we had uh one of our guests he's the bearded uplander tim brown i'll give him a shout out <laughs> he lives northwest iowa um and man that guy he has some there's some prime ground yeah. out in northwest iowa but I, mean, I tell you what, if if you're coming through through Iowa this year and you want to stop, 
feel free. I'll, I'll shoot you my shoot you my information. But. Yeah, I'll be I'll be going through a couple times this year. So we'll, okay. we'll line something up and get get the dogs out. And yeah, whether it's water follow up land, we'll do it. I, I've been hunting with the golden in a while, so I yeah I'm see that. I love all bird dogs. I love hunting different states, but one of my little checklists is always to get my dogs with different dogs, vicious yeah. setters. Yep. Goldens. I just I just like to say, oh yeah, I remember that hunt with that good setter. Yeah. Those diehard GSPs. So yeah, for sure, man. So this video will drop on the 21st, I believe is the date. All right. What is what can we expect from your next what well, will your next Pheasants Forever writing be out by then or will it be out? No, it probably won't be out till July. It may be out late June, but we're thinking July. Okay. Right. Can you give us a very high level what we can expect out of that article? Yeah, we'll be moving on to that next phase in there. And there's, if you like the pictures from the last one, we kind of elevated it a little more. So you get to see a little more of us moving around. Nice. And there'll be some more just discussion of what our life's like. And there'll be a couple little hints of what we're going to do in the future. So I'm trying to keep people captivated because it's, it moves slow in those first couple of months. There's there's not a lot of action that happens, yeah. but I want you guys to stay tuned and stay stay along for the ride because it'll get good once we really get going. And we have some big plans this fall and winter that if the dog's ready, it's we can we're really going to elevate this thing pretty pretty fast. So I'm I'm really excited. I'm really excited. That's it's, awesome. It's gonna be dude. good. I think the writing's getting better. It's 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 different for me, but it, yeah. it'll be good. Yeah. Have you, uh, before we jump off, have you uh, ever read any of Edgar Castillo? Uh, he's Hunt Birds on Instagram. Have you ever read any of his art articles? Oh, I, I eat his stuff up. Oh, we, man. We in the Kansas City area, I've reached out to him. We, yeah. We went, on a couple, we went on a trip down to a bird sanctuary in Oklahoma. I volunteer with the Pheasants Forever chapter here. Oh, okay. I, I eat his stuff up. I, I yeah, love dude. It. He's, he's, he's sounds, really good. Yeah, we had him on our podcast a few episodes back. Man, I I love his stuff. And I can see, I think your writings, you know, I can see where it's coming from. It's Yeah, he's, he's an inspiration and a mentor to me. And I, I, I eat his stuff up. And he, yeah. he's really big into the public stuff. Yep. And this this whole area, the Kansas area, that that's him. He can get on any bird anywhere. Oh, yeah. It's, it's crazy. Impressive. So, so I get moved here in March, so because when I grown up, I always did Nebraska. I yeah. never, I've never hunted in Kansas until last year. Okay, nice. Uh, I've never been down there either. I got family that's down there, and I don't know why I haven't haven't gone down there to visit and hunt. Yeah, maybe we can line that up. Get Edgar yeah. going, get you down here. And, I oh. mean, there's 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 plenty of birds and plenty of space. Yeah, <laughs> and he knows the spots, right? <laughs> he probably blindfold us on the way. <laughs> it's all right though but douglas i appreciate you coming on yeah. to the flushman dustin podcast man it's been a lot of fun it's i'm excited to read the rest of your articles i'm excited yeah. to see the progress of your new pup throughout the summer into this coming hunting season um so i hope like i said your stuff's awesome and Thanks. we appreciate you coming on and uh talking about it and uh we wish the best of luck to training yeah get your dog ready for season um we're obviously going to be following along with you good good so, I'm, I'm, i hope everyone stays stays tuned and i appreciate you having me on this has been cool this has been fun it's yeah been for been sure man so we'll, great communities us outdoor folks it's it's just great and everyone it is. is trying to improve each other so it's, it's yep. good so yeah thanks. we'll have to we'll have to get a hunt in this fall and uh you know meet in person and have a good time yeah, so, I gotta see those dogs work. So keep posting those training videos for me. I like watching them. Yeah, yeah, I'll try. So it's sometimes, man, it gets hard when you do it, start doing like certain things because you try to get the camera right. And I'm like, uh, and then I feel like sometimes the dogs know the camera's on, so they don't actually want to do what I'm telling them to do. And I'm like, God dang it, this is annoying. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I've got some good feedback on those. And, you know, like I said, I, I like, we like helping people. And yeah, it's so great. Yeah, it's it's great to see. It's easy to follow along, and they're, they're short, quick clips. So I can pull one up and rewind it, it and start again and say, "Oh, that's what he's doing." Cool. Yeah, 
for sure. sure. Though, too, or something. Yeah, like yep. <laughs> yeah, awesome. So, again, thank you for coming on the Flushman Dustin podcast. We appreciate it. Everybody, make sure you tune in to his uh, Pheasants Forever articles that'll be coming out throughout the rest of the year. Yeah. Yep. Awesome, right. man. We appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. Have a good rest of your